Ready to roll, huh? Yeah, we're ready to go. Ready to roll. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Today is 29 March, 29 October, the year 2005. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in those conflicts. Today, I'm here at the museum along with special guest Maria Wong. And today, we have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Luftwaffe Helfer Helmut Keller. Uh, Luftwaffe Keller was a German 88 anti-aircraft gunner in Germany and a prisoner of the Allies during World War II. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. Nice to have you here, Helmut. Pleasure. Good. Helmut, would you um, uh, spell your full name for us, please? Uh, it's Helmut Andreas Keller. Okay. And uh, Keller is K-E-L-L-E-R. Okay. And uh, when and where were you born? I was born on the uh, January the 3rd, 1928, in Mönchengladbach, a small town near the Belgian border. In Germany? In Germany. Okay. Um, how small was the town? Well, it's about 150,000. Uh -huh. My father's and my mother's family, they all came from, my grandparents, they all came from that area. From that area. Um, and tracing back your ancestors, were they always lived in that area, or did they always live in Germany, or do you know uh, anything about them? Can I elaborate on that? Certainly. Certainly. Uh, <coughs> when I was 16 years old, I decided to become an Air Force Reserve officer. Don't ask me why. As a, in order to be qualified, I had to prove to the Nazis that I didn't have any Jewish ancestors. Whereupon I went to my grandparents and found out where they came from. And I got a lot of documentation which I have to this day. So I know exactly where they came from. My father's family came from a small village on the Mosul River, which is now part of the city of Trier, an old Roman town. And my mother's family came from this very small town right on the, on the uh, Dutch border. Matter of fact, I found out that I had a Dutch great grandmother. Uh -huh. <laughs> when I was one year old, my family moved to Dusseldorf, which is a fairly large city on, on the lower part of the Rhine. And this is where I grew up. Okay. And what was your father's name? Hans. Hans. And what did he do? He was a uh, telephone specialist working for Siemens. Okay, Siemens. Which in. sold uh, telephone equipment to the to the post office. Okay. I think they also, I'm a dentist, and I think they make uh, x-ray units that yes. uh, I have, they think I have a couple of those. Yeah. Anything uh, uh, connected with electricity, is, right. even today. Uh, yes. Um, and your mother, what was her name and her maiden name? Um, my mother's name was Elisa, but ev everybody called her Ellie. And what was her maiden name? What was her name for uh, Abt, her A-B-T, which is the German word for, for Abbott. <coughs> Um, and what did her father do? Her father had a uh, thriving painter's business. He employed uh, one of the only 17 people. That was before World War One, obviously. And you, oh yeah. And you met her in Dusseldorf. Your, your, uh, your. Oh, no, oh, no, never. Uh, so <laughs> they, they both came from that area. Yeah, then. and they moved, they moved to Dusseldorf uh, in 19. Um, did you have any brothers and sisters? I had, I still have one brother, but we, there were three of us. There were three brothers. I was the oldest. I had one brother who uh, was one year younger, who uh, passed away a long time ago. And then I had a younger brother who was uh, five years my junior. Yeah. He still lives in Germany. Now, our depression that we have had here I, yours was probably worse and started sooner. Is that correct, not correct? It was very can, severe. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about that? Well, of course, I didn't didn't experience any of this, but in talking to my uncles, 
uh, they told me that the inflation was so rampant that uh, you uh, you had a wheelbarrow f full of printed money to buy a couple of loaves of bread, and the the money deteriorated so fast that uh, they couldn't issue a new uh, denomination, so they just printed over the old denomination. So you had uh, bills that were 10 million marks or 20 million marks, and you bought a, a box of uh, uh, bread for it. Yeah. Did. Uh was it, did your parents have a hard time during those years? Uh, surprisingly not. My father was always employed to, throughout the, the whole uh, period. He was always in, he was never unemployed. Yeah. And he, par partially because he, he, had, he worked for the post office and for the government? He didn't work for the post office. He worked for Siemens, right. uh, who sold and installed equipment for the, for the postal for the service, system, yeah. so. which ran the telephone. Right. Business. Yeah. Um, so, what you had? What uh, you grew up in Dusseldorf? What was that? How big a town was that? Five hundred thousand. Very elegant city. You know, on the Rhine, the Rhine split the town into uh, two thirds or one third. Um, I remember that uh, that part very fondly. I I thought I had a very good youth until the war started. And you were in the Hitler Youth. Yeah, in <clears throat> 1938, I was 10 years old. I had to join the Hitler Youth. It was mandatory. They had their own truant officers. And the Hitler Youth came in two flavors. There was the young folk, the young folks from 10 to 14, wearing blue uniforms. And then the regular Hitler Youth wearing uh, brown shirts from 14 to 18. The, uh, as I understand it, it was kind of like our Boy Scouts. Hitler, more or less. Uh, yes and no. There were activities very similar to the camping and that stuff. But you had to participate every Wednesday afternoon and every Saturday afternoon. And I recall, you know, by that time the war was really uh, on. And there was a lot of marching and singing and political indoctrination. Well, as I, as I understand it, I've talked to people, uh, like, even the Jewish boys were in it in, in the, the beginning. I mean, everybody in the beginning, everybody had to join it initially. But uh, because the the, uh, the Nuremberg laws they were passed, I think in '35, you know, where the professors were removed from their jobs. Uh, the, the Crystal Knife, where they trashed the Jewish mm -hmm. uh, stores, was in '38. Yeah. Um, and I am I am assuming that that deep depression made it possible for somebody like Hitler to, to, to gain the, uh, um, his power? I'm not sure of that. Um, the Weimar Republic uh, had many, many parties which blocked each other. You know, there never was a party that could really uh, do something meaningful. And Hitler was elected. At, at the moment. And uh, yes, I think the program that he promised that he would uh, chuck the Versailles Treaty uh, and create jobs, which he did, that. Uh, resonated with people. And for a time, say from 33 to uh, until the war started, my mother told me we were very good times, particularly 36, 37, 38. You know, the, the autobahns were built, and of course all that was an eye, nobody knew this at the time, if that was all with an eye towards the coming war. You know. yeah. So, where did you go to uh, school then in Dizzard? Well, I, the, the school system there was very different from the school system now in Germany and here. You went to a grammar school f uh, from seven, age seven to 14. And if you wanted to go to high school, there was a middle school in between and then the high school. You had to meet <coughs> uh, certain standards and your parents had to pay for it. 
So my parents uh, put me into uh, high school at age 10. You went to high school for eight years. And then you had you know, higher math, uh, Latin, French, English. Hence my English knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good, yeah. yeah. Um, did you like school? Yeah, I think I liked school. I, I was good at languages. Um, Natural science. I wasn't very good at math. On uh, so, that I was so uh, on September one, nineteen thirty-nine, you were in. School. Eleven years old. Eleven years old. Yeah. Yeah. Operations for the air war, <coughs> they put buckets full of sand. We lived in an apartment building, three-story apartment building, and they put buckets full of sand out. <coughs> but we had been conditioned to that um, for several years. There were uh, uh, empty bomb shells in the city with uh, in of every citizen got eight already. So we had five gas masks stored in, in the basement. Uh, and you have to understand, I was a, a child of the Nazi party. In fact, my generation was the generation that Hitler really trusted. Because that's all we heard, right? That the Jews were our this misfortune and all the people around us, they wanted uh, bad things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I never questioned any, uh, any of, of those statements that the government made. So the reason for the war was to protect the German minority in, in, in Poland, you know, which it turned out to be not true. Yeah. Uh, that all made sense to us. So you weren't surprised when, when, when no, I thought that was, it never occurred to me that I would be serving in that <laughs> war. Yeah. Uh, most of us thought, uh, particularly after the fall of France in 1940, that the war would be over in, uh, in a very short time. Um, did, what about your father? Did he get in uh, after the war broke out? Did he go into the service as well? No, my fa father never um, served in the service. Um, 
in the beginning probably because he was too old, though they did draft you know people over 50 towards the end of the war. But he had a special deferment uh, because of his job. You know, to maintain uh, telephone communication was very, very important to the to the war machine. And so he uh, he traveled during the war. He traveled a lot to uh, diff different systems, say within a hundred mile radius, you know, to fix telephone equipment. Um, so. During your school years, when the war was going on, tell us about that. Then. Um, well, our teachers, uh, all the teachers had to be uh, members of the party. By the way, my father was asked numerous times to join the party, and he always declined. Uh, I don't think he was a very political person, one way or the other, but he didn't want to become a party member. You could do that. But the teachers were party members, and many years after the war, I talked to my, my favorite English teacher, and he explained, you know, why he had to be, become a party member if he wanted to teach. But they discussed the, the daily uh, situation at the front in, in Norway and in, in France at the time. And, uh, and of course, we were winning like, like hell, and uh, we thought that was great, you know. And one day, the the door opened and two uh, Air Force officers come, come in and they were students of his, you know, when they told us, you know, all the wonderful things they were doing. <laughs> uh, well, we were, it was very easy to impress us. Yeah. Did you know all the planes and all that stuff? Uh, not then, no, not then. But the Air Wars started almost, almost immediately in 1940. The British started to bomb uh, targets. For instance, there was a railroad line about a block from where we lived, and they tried to bomb that because that <coughs> was the line that went into Belgium and France. But they missed many times, and then they hit the surrounding uh, apartment blocks. So that was the first time I saw dead people lying out in the on the sidewalk in the morning. You know, old families. So then we realized this wasn't going to be uh, as much fun as, uh, as we had anticipated. Also, the, the food was being rationed, so that we were standing in long lines for milk and bread and stuff. Well, you, there was no shortage of food, but you had to stand in line before you got it. Did uh, any, uh, was there any bombs came very close to your house? Or yes, your uh, very close. And did you have a shelter or something that you went to? Yeah, we, we uh, all the apartment buildings in, in uh, all buildings in Dusseldorf, and you know, had, had, had basements. And uh, so they, they created areas where you would congregate. And my father built cots so that we could sleep in the basement because the air raids we left Dusseldorf in '43, but they they increased in duration, and we spent many nights, you know, three four hours, in in the basement, and we could hear the, you know you, you hear the bombs come down, the howling sound of the clouds everywhere. If the raid lasted longer than four hours, you didn't have to go to school the next day. So sometimes the raid lasted three and three quarter hours. <laughs> Yeah, and then in the morning you were kind of bleary eyed sitting there, you know, trying to, uh, you know. Were they, were they at that time just bombing at night? The Royal Air Force, the RAF, yeah. they, they certainly didn't uh, uh, dare to, they attacked some targets along the coast, uh, Wilhelmshaven where the, the North Sea Fleet was, but at that time the Luftwaffe was far superior to their bombers. Right. So they were all uh, night raids. In uh, 1943, the, the raids became so severe that the government evacuated uh, families with children, my mother had three, to uh, the east. And so one day we put, put on a train with uh, a few hundred and we were shipped to a small town near Weimar, Weimar Republic fame, yeah. called Apolda, maybe 15,000, 20,000 very medieval. We thought it was 
was we, we were really a met from came from a metropolitan area and this was a small town you know with uh, everything looked kind of strange and cute and I took the train to Weimar every morning which was about 10 miles away and, and went to the to the high school there at your, at your school in Dusseldorf, did you have uh, bomb shelters for the school? Uh, what would you do? Well, of course, you said there, weren't, enough, no. there, there wasn't any bombing during the day. We didn't have any bomb so shelter in the so school, but we no. weren't in the school during the daytime. But, but we had instructions on how to combat uh, incendiary bombs, life demonstrations in the schoolyard. You know, they would explode one and, and how you would uh, fight them with sand, not with water, and that kind of stuff. And you still, the Hitler Youth was still active at, during the war, too, did you? Uh, yeah, the Hitler Youth was uh, still active. I remember one conversation with my mother. I didn't really care, uh, you know, for all this marching and singing, particularly in the winter. The winters are cold there. And I said to my mother one day, I really don't want to do this, you know. And my mother said, well, but later on when you... Uh, have to get a profession. This will haunt you, you know, because they kept records. And uh, she thought it was a good idea just to go there you know, for the future. And they had it in the little town where you went to, too? Yeah, everywhere. <coughs> well, in fact, um, I was 14 years old and I joined the irregular uh, Hitler Youth. And the Hitler Youth had branches not unlike the military. They had a a Navy department where you rode on boats on the Rhine. <laughs> they had a horse department, you know, for rich kids who could afford their own horse. And I thought it was nice to learn about how to treat wounded. So I, I, I joined the, 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 the medic department. And they would treat you, they would show you how to apply bandages and, and compressions and that kind of thing. Um, so then in 19, this one year that I lived in, in Thuringen, which is the most central uh, German province. Now did your father go there too? Or no, was he, he, he had to stay behind to because he, you know, he could not move right. away. That was a very happy year. So the first time I discovered girls, you know, it was, I was 15 years old. Um, and there was lots of snow in the winter for skiing. Uh, I did a little skiing there, and it was a great place to uh, to uh, roam around. You know, steal apples from, from orchards. And, uh, it was that one year I remember very vividly. It was a very happy time. And then on the 10th of January, 1944, my high school class was drafted into the Air Force. And how old were you then? 16 years. Seven, seven days, seven days, yeah. I was born on the third, seven days. So the whole class uh, was put into uniforms, and they had a uniform blue uniform, but with a swastika armband, which the regular Air Force didn't have. And we were put, there were 54,000 of those high school kids that were drafted all over Germany for home defense. Most of them were put outside of their cities with uh, anti-aircraft bat batteries, be it 20 millimeter or 88s or 105s, and uh, optical fire control or radar fire control. And we were put outside of Weimar, which wasn't really a military target, but it was a route that the, the B-17s took on their way east. Uh, and and we had. By this time, the Americans were bombing during the day, and the, the Amer Americans started to bomb in really uh, got going in '43. But they started as early as '42, and uh, so there was a captain was in charge of a battery of uh, eight guns, and then we had a, a skeleton of regular Air Force uh, soldiers, sergeants, and corporals that drilled us on, on how to use the equipment. Very strict military uh, discipline. You know? I mean, you didn't step out of line there. 
and yeah. we were where was that now this so. is in outside of Weimar Weimar is a yeah. is a city about uh, Paul Gilbert asked me yesterday where is Weimar it's about maybe 40 50 miles west of Leipzig and we had a uh, so we had sergeants. There was one regular soldier who was in charge of each gun, and the rest then were all uh, Luftwaffe and Helfer. And the, the guns were mounted below ground level with a dirt wall around it, and ammunition bunkers were in the in the wall. So it took a direct hit to put the the, the gun out of out of commission. We had lots of drills. Most of it really took only uh, place during the daytime. There were very few uh, night raids. And uh, how many on a gun? Well, I showed Paul yesterday how how this thing works. There were uh, one, two, three, four, five plus the men in charge, six, and then there were maybe three or four more that carried ammunition. The problem was that loading the gun, particularly when it was elevated to 70 degrees, was so hard for a 16-year-old, you know, unless you were very strong, that the soldier usually became the loader, and one of the helpers, like me, I was kind of a wet towel then, uh, they were in charge and had a headphone on that communicated with, with the fire control. They told you, you know, when to change target, uh, uh, what was going to happen in the, in the next minute or so. Uh, so this is through the summer of uh, 1944. And we did fire um, quite frequently at passing planes. And then one day we hit a B-17. That was a day that I never forget because I had no duty on that day. I was standing next to the fire control radar on the outside, a beautiful day, maybe 11 in the morning, and there was a huge formation. By the way, you have to be there to believe this. The sky is black with planes, and the, the sound of hundreds of four-engine bombers is something I never forget. Anyhow, we, so we hit this B-17 in a broken half, and uh, the, the tail sailed off in one direction, and the, the front with the engines running went straight down and crashed at some distance. And uh, so while we were watching this, I look up and I see this black spot coming out of the sky, you know, faster and faster and faster. And then the sergeant, or the sergeant was sitting next to me, with a screwdriver in his hand, was doing something, he got distracted, and he said, he's going to crash if he doesn't open this chute now. And with that, there was a popping sound, pow, and a parachute opened, like 50, maybe 100 meters above us, and there's a man hanging there, <laughs> the enemy. Yeah. And he kind of sailed off a very short distance, there was a little hill and dropped down and the sergeant I said to me, come on, let's go. We ran over there and there he was. He was standing there in a potato field with a parachute around his feet and uh, looked totally dazed, you know, he was shouting. And the sergeant waved with a screw screwdriver and said, hello. <laughs> so the guy raised his hands and I went up there and asked him in my best school English, said, are you British or are you American? I said American. But he couldn't hear because his eardrums had popped. It turned out he hadn't bailed out, he fell out of the plane when this thing broke apart. And I still remember to this day his name, Lieutenant Kaminsky. So we told him to pick up his parachute and, and we walked back to our position. Did you ever try and follow up to where he was no, from? Or, you know, we could probably, I don't know, we'll have time today, but I'll write that down. We'll see if we can track him yeah. down. 
I started with the K. Kaminsky. I was a Polish Polish right. man. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So then we we marched him back to our uh, captain. We had an ensign, an Air Force ensign, who spoke fluent English, you know, and he uh, conversed with him. And as they <coughs> marched him through the batteries, all these kids stuck their heads above the, the earthen dams, and this lieutenant said. Are those that brought us down? And then he said, "Yeah." He said, "But they're boys." <laughs> and so then uh, we kept them, and we called uh, a regiment, and they they sent a uh, a car to pick them up. The raid was over, and we had a two o'clock indoctrination by some big week from the Hitler. It turned out to be a woman. I remember that one too, and she said, well, I hear you shot down a, one of these air pirates, and you captured one. Did you kill him? And we said, ma'am, he's a prisoner of war. And she ran to raved, but it was incredulous to us that she would advertise that we should kill a prisoner of war. You know? The sergeant and I ran to the area where the bomber had fallen, and I'm telling you this because it left such a, a vivid impression on me to this day, and there was a, a truck uh, with two or three Americans. They had no socks and no boots on. They must have come off while they came down. They obviously had parachuted down. There was a dead body lying alongside and another dead body further up the road. And there was a heated discussion between an army colonel, army captain, and an SS officer. It turns out that one of the two had been killed by farmers. He, his parachute landed in a tree, and they killed him. I don't know how. And, uh, and I guess the army I don't know where they came from. They were the, really the first one to appear. And I'm st to this day, I remember you know, the conversation went like this. The SS officers said, well, you know, these are air pirates, air gangsters. <laughs> they deserve to be killed. And the, the army captain said, you know, uh, under no circumstances will I permit that prisoners are being killed here. You know, we have a the, protect, uh, the Geneva Convention, and he took he took whatever whoever was still alive, he took them away. But I also remember the this the faces of these prisoners, you know, this total exhaustion, uh, like you know, I like almost got killed, uh, but I was still alive, and they looked at, at this comrade of theirs. That's it quite an impression. I've talked to, uh, we have several fellows here that were shot down and captured and uh, and what I've learned is that if you went down in the large cities that were being bombed all the time, chances are that the, the civilians would, would try to kill you. And one of our one of our guys that I've interviewed, they, uh, that did happen to him and the German soldiers came and actually saved him because they were starting to beat on him and everything. And, and they did kill a couple of the guys in his crew, but uh, before the the German army came to you know, to, to protect them. So. I was telling but, my my wife uh, yesterday, I think, um, where I lived in Düsseldorf. Uh, nearby was a, a terminal of uh, a trolley. There's a cemetery there. It's kind of rural. And of course, during the war, they dispersed the trolley so they didn't all get bombed during the night. And it's early in the morning, like 5 o'clock, you know, the, the, the conductor goes and gets the first trolley, and he opens up the trolley, and there's a man sitting in the trolley. And he says to him, hey, you can't uh, sit, you can't spend the night, what are you doing? And he looks down at him, and the guy has a uniform on. <laughs> Turned out to be a British pilot who bailed out. and. He figured not to run around in the dark, so he went to the trolley and sat there. And so the conductor then called the called the police, and they you know, took him away. 
one of our other fellows, uh, he also bailed out, uh, but he was in the, in the countryside. And a farmer and his wife and a couple kids came with a gun and you know captured him. But they didn't try to harm him. They they took him back and called the uh, the police or whoever and came and got him. So um, and because you can understand, people that are getting bombed every day, they've got a different a a attitude than people out in the countryside who's probably never seen any bombs. In fact, uh, <clears throat> some of some of the people who did this uh, were. Uh, Prosecuted by the, uh, the U.S. after the war and executed. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if they knew yeah. who they were. Right. So, did you uh, did your gun in place in that area? Did you get bombed very much? Uh, well, uh, we towards the uh, <coughs> by fall of uh, 1944, we were moved to a, a prime target of the uh, of the. Allied Airways, and that was the synthetic fuel factory in uh, near Merseburg, which is 20 miles from Leipzig, where they rolled in coal trains on one end and tank uh, cars came up with yeah. gasoline on the other side. And it was done on an enormous scale. It was a city in itself. And it was bombed uh, day and night. And Paul Gibson's <laughs> Gilbert, Paul Gilbert, uh, Paul Gilbert's <coughs> uh, mission chart that he showed me had two missions to Mazurbok. So I was there when he dropped his bombs. <laughs> oh, <I guess. laughs> and that was something else. They were they had mammoth batteries of they had two rings of flak around this this target. Uh, there was an inner ring that also contained uh, 20 millimeter flak for low flying aircraft. Though I don't think there were that many. You know, fighter bombers sometimes would come down and scrape. Uh, they, did they have flak towers? As no, well? they were all. Uh, it, it's it, the surrounding area is quite rural, so mm -hmm. we were in a in a big cabbage field that became uh, very muddy in the, in the winter when it rained. And our battery had was dispersed over some area, but it had a central fire control either optical during the day when, when the weather was good or radar at night and when the weather was bad. There were 36 guns. So this was the winter of 44, 44 and 45. 45. Now, that was pretty severe winter, was it not? Because I know a yeah. lot of our prisoners talk about that. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the winter in, in, the, um, in Belgium, in those mountains, in the Vosges Mountains is, is always uh, more severe than, than uh, in, in the center of Germany. But I remember there, the, the, there was action almost every day, you know, uh, at night when, when the Royal Air Force came in, in the daytime. And there I saw, you know, uh, lots of fighters, both German and, and American fighters, fighting it out. But the amount of aircraft was unbelievable. You know? I mean, there were hundreds of them. And the anti-aircraft artillery fired into sectors. You know, they didn't track a, a particular plane. <clears throat> they fired into, into sectors and let the, the aircraft fly into it. You know. And so the sky was practically black with, with explosions. You know. It was, was something else. Um, the weather was wet and rainy and, and cold. Not terribly cold, but kind of clammy cold. You know. And the the gun positions were some distance from where we lived, so they had little catwalks over the mud, and they gave us Dutch wooden shoes because leather shoes wouldn't stand up in the mud. But uh, the fun was over; that became a, a grind. You know, you were out there, uh, you know, in the morning. Say they would arrive. We knew that they were coming by ten o'clock, and then the rate was usually around twelve. One two o'clock, and then the Royal Air Force came. Uh, you know, one in the morning. So, um, so at night, did you were you firing up at the uh, <coughs> yeah, RAF we used, as well? Yeah, used uh, like then the radar was used so you, as fire control. So you had to work uh, pretty much yeah. day and, and night. And the the 
the British didn't come in large formation. They came a, a few planes at a time, so the air raid lasted a long time. You know, they came in small, steady stream over the target and, and, and bomb. But the target was so big that they could never destroy it. Uh, we were somewhat elevated above the target. You know, the city of Merseburg was off to the side, and they bombed that frequently. Uh, it had 17 huge smokestacks, <coughs> and we could tell uh, how heavily they hit this thing by the number of smokestacks that were not smoking anymore. You know. But within a week or so, they had uh, most of the factory running again. You know, so, so it was so large. Everything in, within the factory was transported by railroad cars. You know. And there we saw also uh, real tragedies, I would describe them. When Bombers get hit and the, the crews bailed out. You could clearly see that. You know. They didn't wait to deploy their parachute. A lot of them, you know, parachute open immediately while they were still in formation, and then some would get hit by flak fire. The chute would rip or burn, and they would fall down. We had <laughs> one one American flyer landed right in our position. We took pictures of him, you know, put him in the middle, we took pictures, the whole oh. gun crew took pictures of him. <laughs> I guess if you had to be taken prisoner, that was the place to land. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they bombed our positions. There were, I guess there were always some that uh, were assigned to take care of the flag. And uh, one day they hit they didn't. They didn't hit the. They, they never damaged any gun, but they hit the uh, the kitchen. So we didn't have any hot food for, for several days. I meant to ask you, how was the food? Was it getting? Uh... Uh, in the winter of '44, the food was not good and very little. I remember once, I we had a drill out. It was very cold, and I. Uh, they didn't faint, but it became unwell. And this lieutenant said, what's the matter with you? And I said, well, I don't feel good. I'm, you know, I, I, I didn't really eat much this morning. He said, well, why don't you go back and eat? But I said, lieutenant, there's nothing to eat. Well, what could he say? Right? So food wasn't plentiful. We also had Italian prisoners of war that were supposed to help us. The gun emplacement, is this something that interests you? Mm -hmm. It does. The gun emplacement had, uh, beside the ammunition bunker, there was a crew bunker where you would sit while you were waiting, particularly during the night, uh, you know, for things to happen. And there was a little stove in there, you know, to keep a little warm. And the, the Italian prisoners who helped us carry ammunition, they were sitting there with us. And. Uh, and so we got to talk to them. You know, they spoke some broken German, and they told us about their, how many kids they had and, and stuff like that. And uh, But if we didn't have enough food, they really didn't have enough food. Because if you needed some help, say, moving a, <coughs> a bed, you know, triple stack beds, caught one of these prisoners, and, and they did it, and they gave him some bread or some, some margarine. But we didn't, we didn't think much of the Italians as soldiers, you know, because they switched sides during the war. Uh, did, when the war in Europe ended, were you still at, there at the uh, No, Spanish? no. Um, let me see. About January of 45, I was discharged from the, as Luftwaffenhelfer, and was assigned to the regular Air Force. And I remember they just- Is that because of your age? Yeah, but at that time I was 17 years old, and I, I, I had to serve in the, in, the, in the regular force. And I remember when they discharged me, <coughs> they said, well, you have to walk to the nearest uh, railway head because all the railway lines were bombed, which was about 
15 miles away. So I walked 15 miles, something in that neighborhood, at night, and it was beastly cold. And I walked through villages that were dead cows everywhere. They had just bombed it. And finally, by uh, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning, I got to the, the railway head and took a train home and stayed home for a few days. And then I reported to the, to the uh, Air Force barracks in, in Weimar. And then, instead of us going to the war, the war came to us. <laughs> because one day, <coughs> uh, our captain came in and said, you know, the, the Americans are only 60 kilometers from here. We have to build a defensive line. So we were all armed with, uh, well, we had a carbine, you know, the, the standard carbine. And, and Lots of bazookas, you know, the Panzer Faust. Absolutely ridiculous to, to stand against tanks. So we moved out of Weimar, and there was a railway line that went from east to west, from Leipzig to Erfurt. And we dug a position at, at right angle uh, to that railway line. You know, so there was Air Force, to the right of us was Army. And there is a P-47 uh, downstairs. And the gentleman who uh, explained this thing to me was a P-47 pilot, though he didn't serve in the European theater. He served in the Pacific. And I said, gee, I got strafed by a P-47. So one morning, I uh, this foxhole waiting for things to happen. And I'm sitting on, this, on the edge of this foxhole. And I have a piece of bread and some jam, and I'm eating. And all of a sudden, I notice in the dirt around me these dirt, dirt fountains. I turned around, and there were two P-47s hanging maybe 50 meters, strafing this this area. And I fell into this fox holding up my jam <laughs> to spill it. But I could have been dead right there and there. They built P-47s in my hometown. And Matter of fact, the one downstairs was built in my hometown. Really? And my father was a welder in the factory on the P-47, so he may have even worked yeah. on this one. Yeah. yeah. Well, by that time, uh, so this is early April, uh, there were fighter bombers everywhere. The, the passenger trains that still ran had a box car, a flat uh, car attached to the back, and there was a 20 mil mil millimeter quad along with crew uh, that protected the train when they could, if they could. I don't know if the fellow downstairs mentioned to you, but one of our volunteers was a P-47 pilot, and that's and he was in Europe, and that's what they used. He usually went for with the trains, and he his plane went down seven times. He lost seven. P-47s and survive every time. It was usually that the uh, the train would blow up or else he'd get hit by flak or the train would blow up and pieces of the train would knock his engine out or something. So he was always able to get back to our lines and you know and crash land. Crazy, but uh, huh? yeah. So we we call him a, a German ace because he <laughs> took took out seven of our own planes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's funny. Yeah. But. Uh, I, I had friends who, who were Luftwaffe and Helfers who served on, on these uh, flat cars. There was a little shack in the back where they would sleep at night, and every time the train switched engines, they were moved to another train, and uh, if it was only one or two fighter bombers, then they had an advantage. You know, the 20 millimeter quad was pretty effective, but if they had a bunch of them, you know, were sitting ducks. By this time, did you feel the war was lost? Uh, no, I thought I had, I would say I, I never was a political person, but I was a, a nationalist. I really thought it was my duty to defend the fatherland. But I heard my elders, and particularly uh, soldiers who had come back from the Eastern Front, which, which the, where the real war was, who said, we're not going to win this war. The, this war is lost. Um, 
I had, it was very dangerous, by the way, to, to, to tell that. Uh, I had people, once I visited uh, my father, and when I was there, there was a very heavy air raid, and I was sitting in the, in, in the, in the basement, and the place just shook. And there were people there that said, there's no way this, this war can go on. I just had a visitor from Germany, a, a very good friend of mine, we, we, we talked about this, and he said, the, the generals, the German generals knew after Stalingrad that the war was lost. And my, my friend said, and none of these guys had the courage to pull his 762 and put a bullet into Hitler. You know, instead they went out and slaughtered more soldiers. I guess. Had, did you hear about the uh, the attempt on Hitler's life by oh, Rommel yeah, and was, some of those guys? Was, uh, that was publicized, uh, and it was publicized uh, to their advantage. It was described as a very small uh, clique of of officers. In reality, it was more widespread. There were uh, quite a few generals were involved who paid with their life for that. It was too bad that they didn't kill him then. So I don't know whether whether the war would have been over then. It's conjecture. But as far as I was concerned, um, the next thing I hear is uh, the clunking noise of tanks approaching. And what month is this? Well, this is in April. April. You know, this okay. is uh, the day after the P-47 strafe us. And we were sitting slightly higher above a creek bed with heavy brush. And so you can see these, what, I'd say 400 meters. We had one sniper with us. I mean, he, he killed a hare from 400 yards out, which we had for dinner that night. So here are these bunch of tanks, and they stop at 400 yards. And you could see the tank commanders looking at us with their binoculars. And our sniper looks through his binoculars and said, oh, there they are. And to tell you the truth, I should have been scared. I, I had no idea what this meant if they had attacked, attacked us. But they didn't. They, from our point of view, they turned right and went up to the concentration camp. And Buchenwald was oh, less than 10 kilometers away. So they went up and liberated the concentration camp. And then we packed up and, and left. And Did you know what was going on at the concentration camp? Uh, yes, uh, we knew there was a concentration camp where all the uh, enemies of the state were. I remember one incident when I was still in Weimar in, in school, so that was the previous year. I was standing on the platform waiting for my train to, uh, to arrive to go home. And a train pulled in, and in the back was a, a boxcar, and some SS carded, <coughs> ushered a bunch of prisoners out. And one of us said, oh, these are guys that are going up to Buchenwald to the concentration camp. But again, we, we didn't have any uh, second thoughts on that. But you didn't, did you, you didn't know that, I don't, I'm not sure about Buchenwald, where they were, disposing of the, of, the, of the Jewish people or, or the... Well, Buchenwald was not a, an extermination camp. I went to Buchenwald after the war, and I went to Dachau after the war. Okay. The, there were a lot of people died there in the, in the ten thousands of uh, star starvation and maltreatment, but there was no extermination per se. They did that uh, you know, out of sight in, in the East. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, when, when the tanks were practically in front of us, then we were told to, to retreat. I guess there was an encirclement, and that must have been Patton's Third Army, I would guess, that was down there. And uh, we marched uh, all night long and arrived and all day long, all night long, and all the following day in the early, late afternoon, early evening, we arrived at an autobahn 
uh, what other incident. As we're trying to work out there, we, we run into a group of SS, and the SS were feared because they shot and hung anybody who didn't fight. So we're coming out of this clearing, there's this bunch of SS guys, you know. That was the Waffen SS, you know, the military arm of the SS. And we said, hey, well, what are you guys doing here? And they said, well, we are Panther crews. That was a German tank, you know. And we ran out of uh, gas. We blew up our tanks, and now we're going to uh, annoy the Americans for a while. Now we're going to go home. <laughs> so, so they were kind of, we exchanged cigarettes, and, and we moved on. So in the evening, we arrive at this uh, kind of a plateau, and down there is the the, uh, the autobahn, and on it is lots and lots of American traffic, tanks, trucks, and, uh, and there is a major general standing, a German major general first time in sergeant. And our group had a, a staff sergeant, an Air Force staff sergeant, <coughs> as a leader. And this general says, Sergeant, you will collect your men and we will cross the Autobahn under my command during the night. And to my astonishment, this sergeant said, General, the war is over. Do it yourself. <laughs> and, it, <laughs> and at that moment, I really realized that the war was over. You know, I mean, a, a sergeant would never dare to speak to a lieutenant that way. You know? right. And the funny thing is, the the, the, uh, the general said didn't say a word. You know, there were some army guys singing around. They didn't say a word because what could he do? So at night we crossed the the. Uh, the uh, autobahn, and then in the morning we came to a village and there was a woman working in the field, and we had no water, and we said to the woman, take our canteens and go into the village, get us some water and tell us whether there are any Americans, and then she comes back loaded with canteens, and she said, the tanks all over this village, and they smiled as I was filling all these canteens, I, I don't think they <laughs> realized what they were doing. Whereupon our, our leader, who was a lieutenant, said, um, well, this is no good, you know. I mean, uh, we're being surrounded on all sides, everyone for himself. And my hometown was only, was within walking distance. Certainly within a, within a day, I could, uh, I could walk home. So I said goodbye, and I threw all my weapons away except one hand grenade, an Italian hand grenade, which just looks like a little egg, you know, the German hand grenade is a big one. And then I went back the, the way I came. I came to the autobahn and saw all the traffic during the day, and I slept there in a bush until it was dark, and then I tippy-toed across the autobahn. And when I got to the other side, there was kind of a steep embankment, and I couldn't get into the bushes. By that time, I was a hunter man. <laughs> And I walked on the grass alongside the, the autobahn trying to find a, a less steep embankment. And I hear this sound, this whirring sound. I look around and right next to me, like 10 feet away, is a jeep with four soldiers. Let's, How let's did I know they were, they were soldiers? Because I could see the silhouette against the sky. You know, It wasn't entirely dark and they had their rifles there. I fell down on the ground and I lay there and they didn't see me. You know? let's, let's take a time out. Talking, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's good. Okay, so uh, so they didn't see you then. Well, the they didn't see me, and I, you know, 
I was determined to, to make it home because I was so close to where my mother and the, my father had been released at the end of the war. He was there too. So I'm, I'm, I'm walking through the woods and I tried to stay away from, from roads as much as possible. I knew the, the area fairly well. <clears throat> so one, one minute I'm coming out of the forest and I have to cross the road and there is a, a group of, I would imagine they were either Russian or Polish prisoners or, or most likely uh, slave workers. And they spotted me right away and they came running towards me. And at best they would have turned me over to the Americans, but at worst they probably would have beaten me to death. And you had your uniform. I had my uniform. And I whipped out my hand grenade and showed them my hand grenade and they didn't want that, so they let me go. Then I came across a cabin in the woods. There was a, a woman with two uh, uh, daughters, and they said, well, you can't walk around there in your uniform. They gave me a, a, a pair of pants and a jacket, which I wore over my uniform. Anyone of your age, would it be expected that they would be in the service, or I mean, could you get by? Were there were there people of your age that that were not in uniform? No. No. It was virtually impossible. I mean, you had to be really disabled, you know? and even then, they would find a job for you working on on, on some assembly line or, or doing a, a job that was associated with the war. You know? What were the youngest that went in? Well, I was in. the last, uh, the last vintage that was that was drafted. I had a younger brother who was uh, uh, one year younger. He was drafted to work in one of the underground factories where they made uh, V1 parts. Mm -hmm. And your other brother, how how? Was and he? then the youngest brother was five years younger, so he wasn't in the picture. Matter of fact, uh, some years ago, my, my brother, my surviving brother, and I, we talked about this brother of us, ours, who, you know, died when he was very young. What he must have seen in that in that factory, where a lot of slave workers worked at uh, horrible conditions. You know, he never talked about it except remarks about it. So he, he was. Fifteen years old. It must have really impressed him. Anyhow, I'm on my way home. <coughs> I'm walking through this beech forest. I said, "Boy, you know, three more hours and I'm home." And I see this American patrol, rifle ready, comes walking at right angle. And so this is April. There are lots of leaves, and I fell into the leaves and lay there. And they walked right by me and didn't see me. I was really lucky. Then I went on, and I, the last stretch I had to walk on the highway, there was no more forest. And I come to this village, which is just outside of the town where my parents live. And I hear these terrible raucous of people screaming, women screaming, and I'm walking, and I see the glow of a cigarette with somebody standing by the road. And I figured that attack is the best defense, rather than sneaking by there, walked up to him, pulled a cigarette, and said, could you give me a light? And the guy said, sure. And he looked at me and he said, you're a German soldier, aren't you? I said, yeah. Well, he said, I'm a French prisoner of war. I work in, on this ranch behind him. You, you have to be very careful. The village is full of released uh, Russian and Polish prisoners, and they're on a rampage. They kill you if they get you. Thank you. <laughs> so, but I thought that was that was nice, and yeah. and apparently he had worked on that uh, farm, you know, since 1940 when he was captured. And, and uh, uh, I later on met Frenchmen to whom the same thing happened. They were captured and they were sent to these farms. They lived on the farm and were treated like family, you know. And the inverse happened. I knew a German who was became a prisoner was sent to a French farm and he worked there for several years and was treated like a man. 
Anyhow, I tiptoed through the village, <coughs> through the back roads, and I'm a block from uh, where my mother lived. And I had this little can, German army can, of pork in my pocket, in case I got hungry. So I tiptoed down the street, and I could hear voices in the distance. And all of a sudden, I hear this sound of a rifle, the, the catch on a rifle. And out of this dark doorway comes a rifle and a voice says, Halt! And that's when I remember my English. I said in English, don't shoot. <laughs> I stood. This guy comes out. He was 19 years old. He wasn't much older than I was. And he, and he holds this rifle up and he said, what are you doing in the street here? I said, I'm, I'm going home to my don't you know there is a curfew? He said, no. Where are you coming from? I said, I worked on a farm nearby, and I just want to get back to my parents. Oh, well, let me search you. He said, what's this? He thought it was a handgun. He said, it's pork. Oh, OK. But he kept it anyhow. <laughs> then he showed out his rifle, and he said, come with me. And he walked. And of course, I know every house on this street. And as he walks into this one house, and he calls for his sergeant, Willie. Willie comes down. He has a big 45 in his hands. And he tells him that I found this guy walking on the streets, and apparently his family lives nearby. And uh, Willie says, uh, papers. So I figured I pretend that I don't understand English. So papers. I didn't have any papers. So I pulled out my postal savings book, which had this German eagle with a swastika. I gave that to him, you know. <laughs> and he leaped through, what's this, he said, you know. And I pretended I didn't understand. Anyhow, he got frustrated. Then he rammed this 45 into my ribs, he said. There's a curfew from 7 to 7. Do you understand? Yeah, I said. And then he said to the soldier, take him home. So they were very nice. I mean, they could have shot and asked no questions, right? So, uh, so we were walking. Uh, he said, where do you live? I said, down there. And he kind of grinned, which I thought was funny. So we arrive at my parents' house, and open the door, and the whole living room is filled with American soldiers. And their machine guns and equipment are oh. everywhere. And on the wall is my picture in uniform. <laughs> <laughs> and one said, isn't that you? <laughs> but the soldier had orders to take, oh no, the soldier said, now what? Well, they said, take him to the lieutenant upstairs. So the same soldier took me upstairs, dropped me off there, and left. Upstairs <clears throat> was a baron, a Baltic baron, uh, in a very sumptuous apartment. And that's where the lieutenant and some people so they put me down, and I'm sitting here sweating with my. So this was like an apartment building. Yeah. Of which. Well, it was a it was a single family house that had a a, a separate apartment below where my where my parents yeah. lived. And so the, the they told me sit down, and the lieutenant calls for an interpreter. Ah, I said, you know, don't say a word in English. The interpreter comes. And. Uh, and he says, uh, they all sit down, you know, very, very civil. I said, ask him uh, what he's doing in the street. So I again told him the story with the farm. <coughs> when did you leave the farm? And I knew exactly what he wanted to hear. And if I told him that I left after the occupation, then I was lying. So I come up with a safe. I, I had time every time he asked me a question to think about a clever answer. Well, he was satisfied. Well, he, he said, "You asked the other, where are his parents? Well, they live uh, nearby." Well, he said, uh, "We can't take you there now. Uh, you can stay here." I said, <laughs> "I had this Air Force T-shirt which had this huge flying eagle with a swastika." I said, "Great." I said to the interpreter, no, no, I have a friend that lives only a block from here. If you could take me there, I'll spend the night there. OK, so I got another soldier, and he marched me to that door. And I rang the bell, and my friend 
Manfred, I think was his name, his mother answers, and there's an American soldier with a rifle stand, and she <laughs> practically fainted. <laughs> but to make a long story short, my father found me in the morning, and my parents were living with people who believed word for word what a poster said. And the poster said, I, Dwight D. Eisenhower, when on anybody who harbors German soldiers will be shot, his house will be burned. I don't know whether they would have done that, but they believed that. And they said to my father, look, there is no way we're going to have your son here in our house. You have to take him to the Americans. I mean, here was practically home. So my father went to the city hall where the Americans were. Years later, I said to my father, why didn't we just walk around the block three times and told these people they send us back, but no, they lived there, and they kept me. And thus started a year and a half of being a prisoner of war. You know? They shipped me to, uh, to, through various camps and eventually to France. <clears throat> On the way, I learned what real hatred is. <laughs> um, <clears throat> they kept me in a... The first camp was happened to be my <coughs> the uh, recess area of my high school. <laughs> Very cute. <laughs> and then they shipped us to some intermediate camp. And I remember one in one of these camps, a truckload of American and British prisoners arrived who had just been liberated, and I could see the joy in their faces to be out of it while we were in it. And it was very cold at night, and we would stand in big bunches of people together to warm each other, and then from time to time the one on the inside, one on the outside. But eventually I wound up in a, in a, in a camp uh, on the Nahe River, which is a tributary to the to the Rhine. It was a huge camp. I mean, there must have been 50, 60,000 prisoners. Enormous camp. And the drain most of the time was very miserable. Very little food. And we, I had no coat on. You know, standing in the rain for days. And then one day they put us on uh, boxcars and shipped us to France. To uh, place outside of uh, Rennes, which is in Brittany, at the, the bottom of Brittany, and turned us over to the French army. And that's where I stayed until May of 46. So why, is, why so long? Why, why did you have to stay in the... That's uh, the idea was initially that we would work for the French, doing various jobs, but by the time we got there we were so initiated that we were no good to them. In fact, I remember one day we were standing there by the fence contemplating our fate when all of a sudden I'd say a company of Americans in black uniforms arrived and they had huge duffel bags, you know, the, the army duffel bag, mm -hmm. on their shoulders and they marched up there. And we said, gee, funny Americans in black uniforms. Well, it turns out they were German prisoners that came from the States. They were all dressed in creases on their pants and ties on their black shirts. And the French took all their, <laughs> they took the whole buffalo, they had extra shoes and extra underwear and whatnot in there. And they were the ones who went and said, put to work, you know, doing all kinds of jobs. They, some of them had to work in mines and I, I found one, encountered one uh, prisoner in the camp who had lost both of his arms cleaning mines in a, in a, in a minefield, a German minefield, oh, that nice. the French oh, put him okay. to work. Did they, uh, were you treated better by the Americans or the French? Uh, well, neither the Americans nor the French f really physically abused us. Uh, I mean, like standing in the sun for a couple of hours, you know, that was that was standard procedure by both of them. Uh, but the the conditions uh, 
no, very little food, very little food, like 800 calories a day. But also in, in the area of hygiene, remember I wore the same clothes for, you know, 15 months. And, you know, the, the, I think I took a shower maybe twice, there were very little of that. But uh, in a way I, I understood why, because the way the Germans have treated the French, you know, that was payback. And there were French that treated us very nicely. I remember going into a, on, on a work detail into a French uh, army barracks, and some Frenchmen singled out, particularly the young ones, I was one of them, and brought us into a mess hall and gave us um, food. You know. mm -hmm. But it was an unhappy time. But most of all, <coughs> I was raised to respect my elders and I also... I to ask you when you were growing up, was your family religious? Did you go to church or anything? Um, my father was an atheist, but my mother came from a religious family. And yeah, I went to church. I went to First Communion. And my mother was Catholic. But not, you know, not very... Uh, not very rigid, but I remember going to, to church, I say, until the time that I joined the, the forces. I was talking about, you know, respect for elders, but also respect for authority that was kind of pumped into you. Not only by the Nazis, but the whole culture was that way. Today, less so. <coughs> And I saw my elders, who could have been my father, and some of them probably my grandfathers, how they behaved, uh, you know, fighting over a bit of food, a little morsel of food. And uh, of course, it was a situation you either lived or you went under. Uh, and so when I, when I came back, I was a very angry young man. I really, uh, they, they expected me then to to be the same as before the war, and, and I didn't do that. One thing I forgot to mention is while I was <coughs> as, uh, in this POW camp in France, I I caught a movie dysentery. Uh, nowadays, a little antibiotics will fix this, but there was no treatment, and so that was a, a fatal disease. Uh, I remember the, the the first time I fainted in my life was when I, I I asked the camp commander. The camp was separated into cages, a camp within a camp. So if you wanted to go and see a medic or a doctor, you had to have permission to go there. And they immediately said, "Oh yeah, another one," and they put me on a stretcher and carried me to this uh, POW hospital. And apparently they had a. Uh, what I would describe as a filter, to filter out those that survived and those that didn't, which was a, an army tent. And they put me in there for one night, and there were seven of us in there, and only two survived the night. I was one, I was one of them, because I was grimly determined, you know, not to, the war was over, I wasn't going to die. Right? And then uh, they put me into a, a long a wooden barrack, and they put you one end was a, a room for the medics and a, and a German army doctor. And then from there on, they put you into uh, a bed depending on your survival chances. And I was in bed number three, so I guess my chance. But next to me was a major, you know, it was, Ryan didn't play uh, any more role. And then at the end, there were those that were lying in their excrement and uh, really didn't survive. And, uh, there was no, no treatment, and the medic uh, said to me, I said, I'm very thirsty. You, you, you lose a lot of blood, you know, through your stool. And so he opened the door, and there was a faucet outside, and he says, kid, if you, <laughs> I was the kid, if you, if you want to die, you go and drink that water there. And if you want to live, then you drink the one cup of tea we give you. That was it, you know. And you either improved or you didn't, but I improved. So, was there uh, 
a, a command structure in the in the camp. Yeah, there was a command structure. There, <coughs> there was a for each cage there was a German camp commander, which typically was a staff sergeant or something like that. And he was responsible to the French to report. There was accounting every morning, <coughs> you know, the routine, right. you know, when yeah, anybody I, was missing. I, I was watching Hogan's Heroes the other day. Um, and um, he reported them to the, to the French uh, officer, you know, that they were all there. Or if there were any sick, then, you know, how many there were sick and they had to be taken. Um, but there was not a great deal of authority because uh, at the end of the war, um, you know, we didn't want to be ordered around anymore. When you said you came back and you were really angry, were you angry at the circumstances that you ended up in, or were you angry at the government and forget you getting into that, or were you angry at the enemy for putting you through all that? No, no, I wasn't angry at the enemy. I was angry that I felt I had been used and lied to. You know, when I finally found out, it took a while, what really happened. Okay, I was angry at the generation of my father who had felt didn't do anything about this, but in retrospect, you know, what could they do? I, I, went, I had a, here in the, in, in the States, I had a, a Jewish uh, chief engineer, I was an engineering manager, and the chief engineer was a Jewish guy from Germany. We got along very well. And he once said to me, in any of these situations, there are 5% that are against it, 5% that are for it, and the others, they just want to live. And that's, anyhow, I was very, very, very angry. Uh, I, I remember I had to, in order to get ration books, I had to go to some office in, uh, you know, told them I just got back from the war, and then they gave me, uh, I don't know, a month or so of free ration books. And these guys said to me, We all helped to break down the country. Now we all have to rebuild it. Oh, I went through the roof, you know. I said, we? <laughs> I said, you, your generation, you ruined the country. And now you want us to help you rebuild it. Uh, very loud, okay? Uh, he didn't say anything. No, I was, I was really, really angry. And my, my eating habits, you know, were strange. You had this, uh, food was still rationed, but, I mean, there was food. You know, so, uh, but you had this feeling, that it was not in your stomach, it was in your head, that maybe tomorrow there won't be any food. I'll give you one example. My, my father uh, said, um, I have to work some work to do <clears throat> in a hospital where my one of my brothers was born. It was run by Catholic nuns. And you want to come along and I'll introduce you to the nuns and you know, it only takes an hour. And so they introduced me, it was something just back from the war, and she said, oh, to, would you like some a red currant soup, which is a milk soup with cereal and red currants in it. I said, oh yeah, sure. And these are German soup plates, you know, the, the big European plates. And I ate nine plates of this soup. I think after two, I had enough. But And the nun, she had this huge bowl. Every time I finished one, I said, would you like another one? I said, please. And she went to my father and he said, I can't believe this. Your son ate nine plates of soup. And my father looked at and said, did you have to behave like a pig? I said, you don't understand, you know. You have food in front of you that never happened during those year and a half. There was no food in front of you. It, it's up here, you know. It, I mean, gradually it, it, it disappeared, but that was terrible. I would pick up apples in the street, a little knife. I would cut the bed part out and ate the apple. My mother said, you, you eat like a pig. I said, you don't understand what that is. 
Did you have bad dreams or any psychological things going on? I couldn't sleep in a bed for a while. I had to sleep on the floor because, you know, the, we always slept on the floor, on the cardboard, things like that. <clears throat> but you're young, you're resilient, and then things improved. Uh, by 48, things improved um, drastically. They had a currency reform, and then all of a sudden, you had hard money, uh, things were produced, you could go out and uh, you could buy a bottle of wine in a restaurant, there was food that you could buy and clothing and things really improved. Um, the post-war treatment, I guess, of Germany after World War II was remarkably different than after World War I, was it not, yeah. by the Allies? Mm -hmm. Well, I think <clears throat> there was a there was a concerted effort, particularly in, in schools for the young, to teach them what really happened. I think this is different than what the Japanese did, you know, who are mm -hmm. so. kind of denying some of the atrocities. Um, in my home time in Düsseldorf, I went back to live in Düsseldorf for a while, there was the, the seat of the Superior Court where some of the uh, war trials took place for many, many decades uh, by German courts. And school classes were brought every day, a different class, to that court. And there were old people like grandma and grandma sitting and the prosecutor would read what they did to the Jews, the Gypsies, whatever. And also this historic animosity between the French and the Germans was addressed at the highest level. So Adenauer, which was the first uh, chancellor, <coughs> and de Gaulle, they addressed that at the highest level. Uh, and today, if you uh, talk uh, to a young Frenchman about the arch enemy being the German or the French, they don't know what you're talking about. You know, it's, it's and also Adenauer made a uh, an effort to uh, to pay uh, reparations to to the Jewish state. Do you feel that any of those people that did those atrocities were ever really sorry for what they did, or did they always justify it in their own mind? You know, They found excuses, you know, I was, the standard excuse was I was ordered to do that. But the reality is, I'll give you one example, there were police, the regular police from Hamburg in, were, were grouped in battalions and shipped to the east and they were used, in, in the beginning they, they just shot the Jews. And there were individuals that told their battalion commander, Major, I'm not going to do this. I didn't come here to shoot. I'm fighting the enemy, but not shoot women and children. Nothing happened to them. They would shoot out in front of the battalion, coward, and what. Why not? There was a German program. It, there was a central prosecutor in Kassel who, I think, until very recently, pursued war crimes against civilians. And he said, despite all this, uh, <coughs> this killing, there was an order. You, you couldn't shoot a soldier without a trial. You know, there was a, a trial. Mm. And then they would have said, well, who ordered you to shoot these women? Well, my battalion commander. Ah, and who, where did you get your order? And they didn't want that. Or they want to, then somebody would bring up, well, he, he, he refused an illegal order, because that's what it was. Un, under the army code, it was an illegal order. So nothing happened to them. They were probably sent to the front, you know, to fight there, but nothing happened to them. They weren't uh, punished. I have a Jewish friend very good Jewish friend, and, and we talk about the war often. 
and I said, in all honesty, I don't know what I would have done if I'd been ordered to shoot women and children. I would like to say I would have said no, but 17 years old, and some brass standing in front of me and say, do it, I don't know what I would have done. It's hard to put yourself in somebody else's yeah, situation. You have to be there. You have to be there. So, did you go back to school or, or after you were out or what? Unfortunately not. I, I was accepted at the University of uh, Köln Cologne uh, to study electrical engineering. <clears throat> but I had enough of, of school and I didn't take the opportunity. I don't really regret it because later on I went through the ranks of becoming an engineering manager, very successful, made the money, all the money I needed, but I, I didn't, didn't do it. I also sensed that my parents were really no longer interested. Things were pretty rough, uh, say from the end of the war to uh, 48, you know, financially too. Uh, the, the, government had to absorb the, the, uh, the Germans that were expelled from Czechoslovakia and Poland and so they would requisition rooms in your house whether you liked it or not. So living quarters were tight. Life was, <coughs> was pretty hard for a while and so there wasn't really any money to, to send me to the university. At least that's what I think. So did you get a job to start working there? Yeah, I, I went to work in my father's company um, for a while installing telephone equipment. And then one day, uh, my father got me a job in a very new technology, semiconductors, and from the ground up. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, <coughs> I worked in a semiconductor lab but I always yearned to see something of the world. And one day I answered an ad as a technical sales promoter in Central America. And I went there and worked for a company that exported uh, tape recorders, consumer tape recorders. And I lived uh, in South America traveled in South America, but also lived in Venezuela for a while. Met my first wife, an American woman from New York there, and then came to the States in 59. What was her name? Rosary. Yeah. In fact, she is the owner of the timeshare uh, where we're staying. You know? oh, yeah, we're very good friends. Oh. Did you have any children? I had two children. I have a daughter. Uh, who has three children, three grandchildren, two, two girls and one boy. And I had a son who died three years ago. What was your What's your daughter's name? Uh, Christina. And where does she live? She lives in Boise, Idaho. Uh, she moved to uh, Boise, what, two years yesterday. ago? Oh, yes, uh, last year. Last year, yeah. mm -hmm. So when you came to the States, where did you come to then? Um, Went to uh, New York City. My, my. Uh, and what year was that? What year was that? It was '59 in um, November. Okay. Um, first lived in the house of my in-laws in uh, Queens, and uh, hated every minute of New York. <laughs> it, was, it was bitter cold in the winter, and I got a job as a supervisor in a in a place, then, amongst other things, they made tape recorders. I knew, I knew some, quite a bit about tape recorders. Uh, and I worked there for, uh, up through the winter, 1960. And uh, it was the most chaotic place I've ever been to. They, they were, were making uh, <coughs> transmitters, receivers, airborne transmitters receivers for for the Air Force and I was standing by and watched how they did uh, temperature tests and, and they knew that the thing would fail and I said you're cheating Shh, shut up they would replace the crystals while the inspector went out for dinner 
And one day I said to the to the plant manager, it was a little Jewish guy, I said, How did with what I see, how did you guys win the war? He said, Kid, this is not the way America is. <laughs> That's just us. But anyhow, I I wanted to get to California and went to California and found a job there with Ampex, which is a company that makes industrial tape recorders. And a lot of them for the for the Air Force and the Navy. And I worked there for 28 years. Where, in what, what town? Pardon? Where, where in California? Oh, that's uh, on, the, on the San Francisco Peninsula in Redwood City. They have lost some of their luster. They're still there, but at one time they wrote the book on tape recorders. You know, the, the tape recorders that recorded the uh, NASA <coughs> information, satellite information, uh, submarine recorders, we even had a recorder that went into a torpedo. Um, very interesting work, and uh, I learned uh, a lot on the job, and uh, I started as a, as a technician and ended as an engineering manager. Did you take uh, classes? Yeah, and stuff? yeah, I took classes. Yeah. Um, so what year did you uh, retire? In? 80, well there was a reorganization in 87, and they, you know, they gave you one of those sweeteners, um, they, they added a number of years to your tenure, and so uh, they were very good to me, yeah, can't complain. And what have you been doing since? Whatever I want to, travel, <laughs> <laughs> it's the best part of my life, uh, travel. Uh -huh. um, for a while my daughter and uh, her first child lived right next to us, and so I saw him growing up at least for a couple of years. Um, when did you meet Maria? Maria eight years ago. Did you go over and sit down? Come oh. to the picture. Yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, one day my 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 son was. Handicapped and lived in a in a home for the for the handicapped. He had Down syndrome. Oh. And one day, my former wife, who also uh, was married again, came to me and said, uh, "There's a Christmas party at the uh, at the home where our son is, and my husband really doesn't want to go. And uh, how would how would you like to go together? And our son would like that." I went and I met Maria there. <laughs> Were you working? I was, I was working. Yeah, she was working there. Oh. And so I met Maria there. Maria, where did you uh, where did you grow up? Where are you from? I'm from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I grew up there and then I worked there for a while and then come over here. What California. year what year did you come to California? Uh, eighty nine. Taiwan. Now that's Fort what Formosa. Formosa. Yeah. That's so that was Formosa. kind of a. Were you were, were you uneasy about the the Red Chinese? I mean, there was always talk about them wanting to take over Formosa and everything. Yeah, it's uh, it's more talking about here uh, than we are there because you know we just ordinarily live there. We did not feel the danger or feel the. Uh, Pressure. Yeah, the life of there is very easy and and uh, it's very relaxed, much much relaxed, mm -hmm. not competitive. Less. So over here, it's, it's. What did your father do? He was a soldier. He's yeah. um, a colonel. Okay, and Taiwan did they have an army then? Or we yeah. more mostly had a, had a. Yeah, Taiwan has an army. Um, did, uh, during That's the World War II, Japan did Japan control Formosa? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. they occupied occupied yeah, by Japan. Was. So. so was your dad uh, was he a soldier during World War Two? Uh, I think I, I think so. He was worked for Chiang Kai Shek Army. Oh, okay. And then they had a war and they fight with uh, with Japanese. 
Yes, and then the and the communist, and the communist, and the communist later, yes. yeah, and then the whole army was retreated uh, to Taiwan. Okay. So he was, did he grow up, did he, was he born in China then? Yeah, he was born in China. Um, Your mother Zhejiang, too, right? Yeah, my mother too, Zhejiang province. He was a colonel in the quartermaster corps, so he was not uh, but, but a real still, military. Yeah. But, but she has a brother who uh, who served in the Taiwanese Air Force and was trained in one of the air bases in Arizona. Really? Uh, where does he live? In, is he still in Taiwan? He, he's still in Taiwan. So. Does he come to visit you? Or anything? Yeah, he been here once a uh, long time ago. Do you go back there very often? Mm -hmm. Um, and do you all have any children? Yeah, I have one daughter. What's her name? Natasha. And where does she live? She lives in Wana Creek. Close by, not too far yeah, from where you are. Yeah, not too far from us, about one hour drive. Huh? Yeah, yeah. It's about Now, were you, what, how old were you when you left Taiwan? I was, how old I was? Uh, I was 30, 30 something, I don't remember. And <laughs> why did you leave? Why did you come to? Uh, why? Well, I thought I had more opportunity for my daughter. Oh, yeah. yeah, but I. It's another thing. That's one reason. Another reason is for myself. I. Uh, I need new environment. Were you in, in nursing over in Taiwan? Had you been in nursing? In no, I'm not. I'm a social worker. Oh, social worker. And so, did you do that in Taiwan? Were you a social yeah, worker? Yeah, I was a social worker. Strangely enough, her daughter, <laughs> my, my stepdaughter, yes. uh, has a master's degree in, in, in social work. In social yes. work, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, did you go to school in Taiwan? Yes. yes. Yeah. So now, do you still work? No. Mm -hmm. not, not socializing anymore. <laughs> do uh, so. You guys like to travel a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we travel a lot. Where do you uh, Where do you like to go? Or oh, we've been all over the place. How many take me? We all over the place. we're the outdoors type. We like we like to go uh, hiking and camping. Mm -hmm. But we've been to New Zealand, uh, Chile, to Chile, mm -hmm. um, Europe, Germany. We. Uh, we're going to Germany next summer. Um, you still have relatives in Germany? I have a brother there and I have a friend there. In fact, we're staying with a friend who just visited us. And um, let's see, we've been to um, Italy. We've been to Italy. We once right. drove from Munich to uh, Rome through Italy. I used to speak Italian when I was when I was very young, you know, so that, that worked out all right. And you spoke French too, I suppose. Yeah, I spoke French and then I learned Spanish while I... I really learned that uh, on the job, uh, Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> South America, were there... Um, I guess it was... Was it, Argen was it Chile or Argentina where so many of the Nazis went after um, World War II? Argentina. 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 Yeah. yeah, Iceland went to Argentina yeah, and, and, the, and the Israelis got in there. Yeah. Do you get down here to the desert very often? Yeah, we've been uh, we've been to this area driving through once, uh, coming from there's there's a new uh, desert park, maybe what sixty miles uh, north of here, between Highway 15 and the old Highway 395, 66 that area. Oh, uh, Route 66. Amboy yeah. from Amboy on mm -hmm. north. Okay. Is, yeah, yeah. We, we, we were there uh, in, the, in the spring when, when the desert came, so yeah. we went to Joshua Tree and Anso Borrego, and yeah, I like the desert. We, we've taken quite a few trips to the southwest, you know. Do you have a camper or? or no, you ride, just, just, just a backpacker's tent, you know, oh, I see. camp anywhere. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, it looks like you are really enjoying life now, yeah. and well deserved. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, we're really, really enjoying it. That's one of the reasons why I don't want her to go to work, because then we only have weekends, so we can, you know, at the drop of a hat, we can go off. Sure. 
And we have, I have relatives in, uh, in England. I have a cousin who married an Englishman. And uh, they have a wedding in the, in the family. And in February, we're going to go there and uh, attend the wedding. Well, it's so nice that uh, you were able to come in today. I sure enjoyed talking to you, and uh, and uh, glad things are going so well for you guys. Helmet, thank you. Well, thank you. My pleasure. So yeah. Is there anything else you well, want to add? No, I think uh, the reason why I remembered all this well is I yeah, just did I uh, <clears throat> I wrote the history of my life about six months ago at the urging of a friend. Mm, you, said, did. you should really write this down for your grandchildren. Absolutely. So I did about 30 pages uh, you know, of the most important items in, in my life. And so some of the, uh, quite, some of it was quite emotional because as you write it down, you relive these scenes. Uh, well, could you send us a copy of what you wrote? No, so there's some very private things. Oh, there, okay. You know. Well, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe edit it and send us. <laughs> can you do that? Like, <laughs> or I mean, you know, I, I, well, if not, that's possibly, good. possibly could do that. It would help us because we'd like to have it. I'd say we'll we'll write it up from here yeah. from this, but okay. in your yeah, own I words, could, I could do that, that would be helpful um, yeah. because there will be like like places that the spelling and all that stuff. You, so, uh, could you give me uh, your card? I yeah. shall. I shall. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll wrap it up then. Great, thank you. Oh, you didn't know? Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you go on over by it, and then we'll talk about it a little. Let you talk about it a little bit. <laughs> okay. Tell us. Yeah, the different. Uh, can you start kind of explaining about it for us? Well, <clears throat> this one is a, a field gun. Whereas the one we had, this base here was on a concrete platform. So you didn't have to sit there, you could stand and operate it. Uh huh. And you, you said that they kind of, you had it kind of buried. Yeah, it, it was surrounded by an earthen wall, you know, for, for protection. Yeah. Um, was it on wheels like this? No, no. It was this base here. Uh huh was mounted on a concrete. Oh, I see. Okay. So that means that the whole thing was at least, what, two feet lower? Uh-huh. And in operation, this one here, you take the wheels from the back away, and then this whole thing rests on, on these bases. I see. Oh, OK. And these dials here, you know what these are for? No. The, uh, this one here determines the, the elevation of the gun, the azimuth. Uh -huh. That one here determines the side angle. And the center fire control moves. This thing comes with two speeds when you, when you uh, pull this lever out. The two gears are there. Yeah. One moves it fast, and then fine-tuning with that one. These two pointers are run by the by the fire control. Okay. And then, by turning this crank, you have to keep that pointer right there in the middle. And then that puts the gun into the firing position that the fire control wants. So this is for the elevation, this is for the side angle, and on the other side is a third one that sets the, the fuse and the distance to the, to the target. If you come around, I'll yeah. show you the other side. Okay, let's do it. <clears throat> there is a... You have two... Real life, this is out, and you stick two shells in here, one here, one here, at all times, and then there's a guy standing here and he turns this crank, this is all frozen now, continuously, it makes kind of a roaring sound, and another operator 
in real life stands here because this is lower. Mm -hmm. I mean, the field sits here. And he turns that crank, and again, he keeps that pointer over that one. And this sets the fuse at the tip of the 88 millimeter shell. There is a fuse with notches in it. And that machine here constantly turns the fuse to the target. This is a lay fuse. Mm -hmm. And then, <clears throat> when this bell starts to ring, I think you have two seconds. By that time, of course, the gun is pointing towards the sky, maybe at 70 degrees. You then have to take that shell out and stick it in the breech here. Oh, mm -hmm. And the breech block is missing, as you can see. The breech block was taken out. And then as you shove the shell in there, you, put, you have a lever glove and you push the shell in. And that triggers the the breech block. The breech block then comes out and pushes your hand out. Oh. And then you fire. The, this is all frozen. This here opens the breech block. After you fire, you open the breech block again. So the, the bell rings, and when the bell ends to stops, at that moment all the guns are supposed to fire. But in real life, of course, your whole battery should fire at the same time. We had the, the last one I, I served on was 36 guns spread over a large area. They all fire at the same time. Uh, what about concussion? Well, <clears throat> it depends upon the crew. We, with, with the boys serving, we could fire every one shell every seven, seven seconds. But the regular Air Force fires one every four seconds. Enormous, very fast firing rate. Uh -huh. and, and was there um, any recoil with it or? Oh yeah, and, and these are the dampers, you know, these, these uh, there's four of them, one, one in the middle, one on the other side of that one. That's the recoil damper. <clears throat> so what did it do? <clears throat> well, the, the, uh, the gun then runs, when you fire it, the recoil runs this along here and it comes back. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and over here is a plug, and that's where you put a, a, a pair of headphones in with a long cable. Mm -hmm. And that is the communication, the one way communication of fire control to the gun. They tell you. A change of target, and then you yell change of target, which means you crank the gun around very quickly. Um, so you get, you, you get information what's going to happen. You know? So it would have a loudspeaker or something you could hear no, what they're saying? Headphones oh, headphones. Uh -huh. you, yeah, you wouldn't be able to hear. And, you, and I, I did that many times because the regular soldier who was in charge of the gun crew was really the only one who could load 200 rounds or 250 rounds. You know, we couldn't do that. Right. And so he gave the headphone to some somebody uh, like me. <clears throat> I probably weighed, what, 120 pounds <laughs> in those days. And then you ran around and, you, and then you told them, um, group fire in five seconds, and then the bell started to ring, and then off you went. But the real the, thing is that the 88 turned out to be the best anti-tank gun the Germans had. Right. And here, this plaque here describes there were a number of models. Um, the 88, 18, 36, 37, 41, and 43. This is an 18. They all look very similar, except for the the 41. The 41 was intended primarily uh, as an anti-tank gun, and so they wanted to lower the whole gun to uh, better conceal it. 
Mm -hmm. And so the height of the whole gun was only a meter forty, which is something like this. Oh. And it had a barrel that was quite a bit longer. It had a six meter barrel, very long barrel. And it could hit uh, a, a tank from over a kilometer away. So Krupp made these? Well, there were a number, during the war was a number of, of companies that made it, but the original design was Krupp, yeah. yeah. And you said that there's some Spanish markings are on the yeah, gun? Yeah, Spanish language markings are all over. For instance, there is a break here that I spotted. Yeah, here. Oh, yeah. Cerrado, uh, closed and open. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. There's a number of them that they... So that leads you to believe that they used that during the Spanish Civil I'm War? Because sure, yes. the Germans were uh, helping Franco then. And then the 88 was also used in, uh, in uh, the Tiger tank. And then they used it as an oh. anti, uh, purely anti-tank gun. You know, she couldn't elevate it. Right. It had only one purpose. That was the oh. Pac-43. Uh -huh. Which I never saw. <laughs> were they painted gray like this? They were painted. No, no. no the, well, were they, the were they camoufla product, camouflaged? The one we had, they were, they were painted in a shiny olive-like color. Mm -hmm. uh, very smooth. This is very rough paint. Yeah. It was really a, a shiny. And that was one of your jobs to keep it clean, you know, to, to clean the barrel and the whole gun was. Yeah. Well, thank you. Is there anything else we want to talk about that one? No, I think that that's about it. They asked me whether we had uh, earplugs. No earplugs. <laughs> and remember, the the gun has kind of a very dry bump sound. You know, kind of a more of a loud popping sound. But they fire at such rapid succession that um, I remember two, three hundred rounds uh, when one wave came. So uh, after one, you're pretty, uh, pretty deaf. You know. Where did, where was the shell ejected? Shells ejected. Well, that's another problem. Just imagine this thing is surrounded by an earthen wall. Ammunition bunkers are in the walls. All these cartridge shells, which are about this tall, they come flying out. How tall, how tall are they? How big are those shells? The shell, well, the total shell is about this high, and the cartridge is about this high. Yeah. And so the old floor is covered with those, and you trip over them because you're standing here, you're not sitting. And that's where our Italian prisoners came. They had to grab these empty shells and throw them over the embankment. They're pretty hot when they first come out, aren't they? Well, for a while, initially. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. But after a while, they grew up. Yeah. And there were lots of those, several hundred. Uh, and they were collected then, I guess, they melted made new ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. But Bring. If you can envision this gun without any of this here. Yeah. All of this here, just this base was standing on the ground. That was the gun. Yeah. So it didn't look as massive as this construction. And it just had, well, did it have uh, the trajectory just up and down, or could you rotate it as well? Well, you, you know, this one here rotates the gun okay. 360 degrees. Yeah. That elevates it up to 70, I think 70, 70 degrees. 70 degrees? Yes. Mm -hmm. 70 yeah, degrees. 70 degrees. Mm -hmm. And the muzzle velocity here says 820 meters per second, the 8837 on which I serve had a, a muzzle velocity of 1040 meters per second, pretty, oh. pretty fast. Yeah. Well, great. I'm glad we got to do this. Thank you.